Welcome to Stories After Midnight. Today we'll be reading The Invisible Door by Tobias Wade. It's part of a collection of stories called 54 Sleepless Nights. If you'd like, you can pick yourself up a copy on Amazon. Links will be in the description. A huge shout out to my patrons for helping make this episode possible. Let's get started. Back when I was in the fourth grade, I was friends with this super clean-cut kid who always tucked in his collared shirt into his khakis. He was brought up religious while my family wasn't, and we had this running game where we both tried to come up with questions to trip the other up. I remember one time sitting on my couch playing video games when I told him everything could be measured, and his counter was to ask how I could measure the distance between heaven and hell. I was completely stumped, but I knew my dad would know because he knew everything. We ran to ask him in our dreadfully white kitchen, where he spent most of his time because it was the room with the best light. He put down the book he was reading real slow, looked at me over his glasses, then at my friend, then back at me before finally saying, A second is more than enough time to get there, if that second is bad enough. That answer always stuck with me. I came back years later when I was a sophomore in high school, and the vice principal peeked into my English class to call my name in a low, hushed voice. I thought I was getting in trouble for something, until I got into the hall and she handed me a cell phone, from which an excessively calm voice told me that my father had suffered a massive heart attack and had passed away, even before he got to the hospital. I remember thanking the faceless voice for telling me and hanging up. After the call, I looked down at the phone screen and noticed that the call lasted 10 minutes and 23 seconds from the time the vice principal first picked up, and I wondered which of those was the one where I made the journey. The best man I've ever known died when he was only 42 years old, and anyone who has lost the one they admire most knows how it feels for part of themselves to die with them. It didn't occur to me that my second between heaven and hell hadn't happened yet though, and that it wouldn't happen until a night in college when I discovered the secret door in my house. It was an old Victorian style house that looked more like a bunch of smaller houses had randomly smashed together than any deliberate construction. There was a group of eight of us who pooled together to rent the place, which ended up being way cheaper than individual dorm rooms. Even after we'd been there for a few months, we kept discovering new things about the place, like a fireplace that had been boarded up, or the dumbwaiter chute hidden in what we thought was an electrical box. Well, one night, five of us were hanging out in the living room, when Derek, engineering major with a mouth that never seemed to fully close, showed us this trick he learned. He put a layer of clear tape over the phone's flashlight and colored it in blue with a marker, then another layer colored purple, and a few more going back and forth like that. When he was done, he turned on the light, which was now filtered into UVA and worked like a black light. We had all been drinking a bit by this point and laughed enormously at all the gross, glowing splotches on the couch. We turned out the rest of the lights to make the colors pop, and took turns shining the light on our teeth to make them glow. Then we chased around Chrissy, the only girl in our group, whose makeup reacted to make her look like some sort of demonic clown. She was less amused and probably less drunk than the rest of us, so she took off up the stairs while we all followed. Gregory had a perfect Australian accent, and he made the Steve Irwin voice like we were stalking some exotic beast that we didn't want to frighten off. It was all in good fun, but Chrissy was in no mood and she locked herself in her room. The slamming of her door cut through our buzz a bit, and we all felt like idiots, and the game didn't seem so fun anymore. It was during this moment of sudden quiet that the light fell on a blank patch of wall, and the outline of a door suddenly glowed from nowhere. Derek, Gregory, a third guy named Preston, and me, all staring at it in silence like we'd just been visited by a UFO. Dude, Preston said. Dude, the rest of us replied in a solemn chorus, the only appropriate response in such circumstances. Derek ran his hands over the outline. It quickly became apparent that the light was shining through the wallpaper. As you can imagine, with four buzzed college boys, We respected the property and wouldn't dream of tearing off the wallpaper on a rental just to satisfy our idle curiosity. At least for a few seconds, anyway. 
Derek had a pocket knife on his keychain, and he slid it into the wall to trace the outline of the door, which was positioned almost exactly between his room and Chrissy's room on the other side. It didn't seem like there was enough space for a third hidden room between them, and consensus said it couldn't have been larger than a closet that had been sealed up. We peeled back the wallpaper to reveal a solid wooden door that matched the design of the rest of the house. But it wasn't the door that was glowing. There was a thin gap around the edges, and whatever the UV light was reacting with was coming from behind. What if it opens into Chrissy's room? Gregory asked. She would literally kill us if we all just tumbled through. Hey, don't worry about it, Preston said. We'll just tell her it was your ID and we were trying to stop you. He pushed against the door and it gave a little seeming more stuck than locked. Chrissy, you'll want to come see this, Gregory called through the wall. We promise not to shine the light on you. The language in her reply would have been sufficient to embarrass a career criminal and doesn't need to be replicated here. It was too late anyway because Derek had put his shoulder to the door and had already forced it open. Whoa, it's bigger than here than I thought, he said. Damn, brighter too. The harsh light was reflecting from a room painted entirely in white, from the cabinets to the white counter to the white tiles on the floor, even the furniture, a familiar set of white wooden table and chairs. Why would they need an extra kitchen upstairs? Preston asked, wandering inside. Duh, for the servants, Gregory said, moving down the line of cabinets to open and close each one. Hey, there's food in here, cereal and rice and stuff. Cheerios and frosted flakes. I already knew that without looking. Servants don't need their own kitchen, idiot, Derek replied. Rich people with servants don't even go in the kitchen. You're going to suck at being rich as much as you suck at being poor now. Damn, dude, that cuts deep, Gregory said. The fridge is working too, and this food looks really fresh. I reached through the darkness on my right and flipped on the light switch, exactly where I knew it would be. How could I fail to recognize the exact kitchen in the house I grew up in? Everything from the design of the room to the same brand of microwave and same blue curtains with white clouds hanging on the opposite end of the room. The only difference was that the windows were all walled up now. Every detail was the same. Family pictures hanging on the wall. Fresh tomatoes on the counter from my mother's garden. And yes, as hesitant as I am to say aloud for the pure absurdity it sounds, even to me, there was my father sitting at the kitchen table with a closed book in his hands. My friends all flinched from the light of my flipped switch, their sudden unease apparent. How could the food be fresh? Derek asked quietly. We've been here for months, and it must have been sealed up for longer than that. You don't think someone has been living here, do you? Preston asked, taking a hesitant shuffle back toward the door. No way, Derek said. I don't even know how there's, there's space for a room here. There definitely couldn't be anywhere else for them to hide. I don't know what bothered me more, that I was seeing my father again for the first time since his death, or that my friends obviously couldn't see what I sensed directly before me. My dad was staring right at me, looking at me the way I remember him in my most nostalgic childhood memories. Strong and healthy with straight brown hair without a hint of gray. Keen, stern eyes over the rim of his glasses were locked on my own. There had to have been someone, Gregory said, agreeing with Preston and backing toward the door. There's still dishes in the damn sink, and they aren't even moldy or anything. Let's get out of here. Yeah, I bet the landlord lives here. Hell, I bet he's still been living in the house to keep an eye on us, and we hadn't noticed. This place is big enough, and he could have just been using the back door not leaving his room. I know he seems suspicious, even after we paid the security deposit, Derek said. We're probably in his kitchen right now. By this point, all three of them had crowded back out the door. I still hadn't broken eye contact with my father, who was now smirking softly. I felt helpless to blink, let alone follow my friends. Hurry up, man, Gregory called to me. If he catches us here, he's going to be pissed. We could just use Derek's clear tape to put the wallpaper back up and he will never know. You should go with them, my father said in his voice, as thoughtful and measured as it always had been. You wouldn't want to be caught somewhere you don't belong. I'm going to stay, I said to my friends, my back still to them. 
You guys go ahead. I'll catch up. Seriously, man? The landlord is going to kick us out if he catches us, Derek said. Please hurry up. The second that you've been thinking about your whole life, my father was saying. He pushed his chair back roughly across the floor and stood to face me. Did you hear that? Preston asked, clearly reacting to the sound of the chair. Oh, he's coming. Screw it, let's leave him. If he gets caught, it's his own fault. I'm not going down with him. Is almost here. My father finished. I didn't move. I think I'd forgotten how to. I was in such a state of shock that I didn't know what to do. And all I could think was that if I left now, then I was sure I would never see him again. A few frozen seconds passed together in one big clump of time. And before I could react, I heard the sound of the door closing behind me. The slam snapped me to my senses enough for me to turn and look at the place my friends had stood a moment before. I jerked back to face my father once more. He had taken a step closer. A brain makes sense of scaling and distance, so naturally that we hardly ever notice the process until it stops working. That's the effect I felt when my father had grown several inches in apparent height from the single forward step he'd taken. The effect was replicated with his second step, which brought him towering over me in a way that I hadn't seen since early childhood memories. And as he moved, he seemed to be aging, putting on weight, as his skin creased and wrinkled before my eyes, his stature shrinking backward toward a more moderate perspective, so much less powerful and sure than he had a moment before. This process didn't slow as he reached and then passed the age he appeared when I saw him last. Second by excruciating second, I watched him growing old as he never did in life. He appeared more wise than ever as the gray blossomed into thick white hair, his eyes sparkling all the more for their piercing insight. All too quickly this, too, had passed, making way for the shriveling and decrepit decay of old age. He was still moving towards me, only a few paces away, but he trembled every time he lifted his leg to move. One step away, but he never made it any closer. His tremulous leg collapsed suddenly under his own weight, and he pitched toward the floor at my feet. I dove to catch him, and together we both tumbled, although I at least managed to cushion his fall. I held him against my chest for several seconds, afraid to pull back and look at his face for fear of what withered shell of a human being which would remain at the very end of these prophetic years. I felt his fingers clutching feebly against my shirt, then they stopped. His last breath rattled free, and all the heat fled from his corpse against me. And in that breathless second, I think my own heart must have stopped as well. Because never in my life have I felt such a profound stillness, broken only by the probing fingers, which began to stir once more. The fingers weren't soft and warm anymore, rigid and bony, pushing into my chest like I had fallen against sharp rocks. Harder and faster with every moment, pawing at me like an animal desperate to dig into the ground. I tried to wrestle free from the cold form, wrapping itself around me. It heaved upwards and pushed me into the floor, its rigid legs pinning me painfully while its hands tore into my chest. I managed to get my arms out from under me and tried to cross them over my body to shield myself. I might as well have been trying to stop a crowbar with my hands. The force of the flashing bone pummeled through my defenses and tore my chest open, but I didn't feel any pain. The skin parted as cleanly as the knife through wallpaper had. The skeletal hand inserted a finger into the crack and slid it down toward my stomach, and my whole torso began to open up in the same clean fashion. I couldn't breathe or call for help, and I was helpless but to lie and watch as the skeleton inserted its second hand to widen the cavity in my body. I willed myself to watch and not look away. I couldn't see the leering. I couldn't not see the leering skull above me, grinning in blasphemy against my father's gentle smirk. The skeleton kept at its work until it had split me from head to groin, cleanly separating me into two equal halves. I distinctly wondered which half of me was doing the wondering, but that thought quickly gave way to a fixated awareness on the empty darkness which existed in place of blood and bone and internal systems. No, not darkness at all. 
There was a single light in there, too, perhaps a single soul for us both to share. And like a single star in the night sky, it was made all the brighter for the vast emptiness around it. Gently, slowly, with reverence as though stooping at an altar, the skeleton lay down inside me. Its arms were my arms, its legs were my legs, its skull sliding into the black emptiness of my head to fit snugly into place. Then those arms, which were not my arms, curved around my body, hugging myself and pulling the two halves together to form a single whole. I didn't go in that room again after the wallpaper was put back up. That must have been the first night since he died that I didn't miss him anymore. I don't know how long this process took, maybe ten minutes or more, but whenever I remember it, I like to think of it all happening in a single second. After all, if that's all it takes to get from heaven to hell, then why wouldn't someone who was made whole again make it back just as fast? That's the story. I really hope you enjoyed it. If you did, I'd love it if you consider liking the video or subscribing for more creepy stories in the future. If you'd like to do more, there is a Patreon where I upload all of these videos as soon as they're edited, so you're usually getting them weeks in advance. And a couple things here and there, but generally, that's the way it's going, is like early access and stuff. Uh, outside of that, we do have a Discord if you'd like to come join, and uh, storiesaftermidnight.com if you'd like to send me your story to read on the channel. But anyways, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, I really, really appreciate you for listening. So, I hope to see you next time.